took me a while, I guess. But yes, well, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you. And uh, yeah, I, it's, uh, it's been a very interesting time since the pandemic because we've had so much, I guess you could say, upheaval. And, you know, in, in the U.S. in particular, we've had the pandemic, we've had uh, political upheaval, uh, a lot of business change going on. And it seems like it's a really a, a great time of opportunity. I uh, recently read another book by Lisa Feldman Barrett, who is a famous neuroscientist, called Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. And in it, she leads all of her lessons about the brain to the idea of um, social reality and that the brain creates social reality. And, and that is usually a lot of the stuff where our beliefs are based, from which our behaviors come, and it creates the world that we agree to live in. And as you were just suggesting, this is a great time where it looks like we're all really examining what those agreements are and trying to make sense of them, because a lot of them aren't working out real well. And I think yep. part of that is especially because we've become a global society and social reality up until now has not been built on global perspectives. It's been built on, you know, national perspectives or local perspectives, whatever. And I think that, um, you know, my topic is emotional intelligence. And I think that emotional intelligence and the study of emotional intelligence, the practices more than anything and the skills of emotional intelligence give us an opportunity to really work with opening up to the new possibilities. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure about uh, Vietnam. I'm not extremely familiar with your culture there. But I think largely in the world, uh, emotions have been rejected a lot of the time. There are many societies in which emotions are, are looked down upon and, uh, or categorized. So, for instance, in the United States, we've had an historic focus on very positive emotion since about the 1930s. And, you know, success and positive emotions will lead to success. And so because of that in particular, um, we reject any uncomfortable emotions. And yet our uncomfortable emotions is where a lot of the richness of being human lies. And so when we don't deal with our uncomfortable emotions, we end up being not fully human. And um, I think right now we've gone through a period of time worldwide where a lot of uncomfortable emotions have come up because of the pandemic and social change and other situations. And uh, it's really given us an opportunity to struggle with experiencing those emotions making sense of them and using them to come up with what I would say would be a more human world where mm. we get to be our whole selves and we don't have to, I, I know Americans are reputed for running around with smiles on their faces at all times. <laughs> and uh, sometimes when we visit other cultures, they, they think we're kind of funny for always smiling instead of allowing ourselves to look serious or experience some sadness or whatever might be true for us. So um, this has been a, a, a personal exploration for me because as a kid growing up in an American family, which had a lot of stress and dysfunction, I was particularly taught that uh, my emotions were bad but I was naturally a, a very feeling kid. And um, 
over time, I, I had a, an experience one night where I was very afraid. I was home alone and I knew I shouldn't be afraid. And I was trying not to be afraid, just being you know, like seven years old and being home alone. And I was watching television and it was probably some show like Lassie where, you know, boy and his dog and uh, little Timmy, who is the boy, was very frightened. And I noticed on the show that all of the adults were supporting him and and uh, taking care of him and trying to make him feel that his fear was okay and that they had taken care of the situation and now it, now it was over, he was safe. And when I saw that, I just immediately thought, wow, you know, I want to do that. I want to be that kid that shows other kids that it's okay to have your feelings. So at that point, I decided to be an actor and uh, didn't get a lot of support for that. My family thought I was crazy, but I got into shows in school and you know, I eventually got myself into a very good university with the theater program. And I went to New York and did some acting there off off Broadway and ended up going to LA and uh, doing some learning at one of the studios. And I continued and I continued. But the interesting thing was that I had been so well trained as a kid not to have my emotions, that as an actor, I was pretty good at representing emotions, but I wasn't very good at just being in the moment and having them. So my career didn't go very far. But I had taught speech in college, and I loved interacting with people on a coaching level and in, intuiting uh, what might be affecting their speech and their acting and decided that business people might be interested in learning and you know having that kind of training. And that's when I started going into training and training in businesses. And I worked for a company for several years teaching things like presentation skills, creating conflict management classes, those kinds of things. And then Daniel Goleman came out with his book on emotional intelligence. And I read the book and I was thrilled because this was an, another book about making feelings okay and making them workable, especially in the workplace where there was a lot of belief that emotions didn't belong in the workplace. You were just supposed to be positive, you know, focused on your goals, but don't really be real or don't really be yourself. And it kind of created a situation where uh, persona was important. So we, we sort of learned to develop our work personas. And then uh, that limited our ability to have all of our capabilities with us. So um, I understood persona because a lot of acting was about creating persona. And uh, I understood that when you're working from persona, again, you're not connected to your feelings. The other thing that uh, Goldman's book showed me was that by teaching presentation skills and, and teaching people to be more expressive, that I had been working with emotional intelligence the whole time that I was doing training. So I became very fascinated with the topic. I got a couple of certifications. I got certified in EQ 2.0 and also Mesquite. Uh, most recently, in fact, right before or as uh, COVID was breaking, I was at Yale getting certified in Mesquite. And so it's been a, a great journey for me. And um, I started noticing in my coaching and in myself, because working with other people, you also work with yourself. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of different kinds of therapies and things like that to be more expressive and really figure out what was going on with my emotions. And I started noticing in my clients what I had discovered in myself is that often 
when something was blocking me, when I wasn't able to perform the way I wanted to perform, that there was usually a feeling that came up that was very familiar that I didn't know how to deal with. And um, that, that particular pattern would then sort of divert my behavior so that I couldn't go in the direction that I wanted to go. I would just kind of be stuck and having an experience that was probably from many years ago. And, you know, I'd, I'd be working with coaching clients and they might have a problem like procrastination or overworking or something like that. And I just started asking them, well, I'd like you to pay very close attention to just what's going on in your body and your feeling when you run up against this particular issue and see what comes up for you. What is that based on? And through that, often those things that came up were related to the past. And um, when they were able to identify what that was, for instance, one guy I was working with was really driven to go above service agreements. He was working in technology and was kind of sort of a help desk person. He was a technician that helped people figure out what was, what was going on with their systems. And he was staying up till four in the morning sometimes working on problems and solving every problem that he ran into. And then that would affect his billing to his company and also his company's billing to their customer. Mm. And when we, when we really talked about that, it boiled down to the idea that he had developed a lack of worthiness. He had just been through a difficult marriage situation and uh, this lack of worthiness was something that had uh, been pretty prevalent in his life. But there was a particular feeling that came into him that affected his thoughts that created this cycle of driving himself beyond what was appropriate and then creating problems for the organization as well. And when he was able to identify that feeling, at that point, then he could stop, you know, just realize that this was something from the past, feel where it was in his body, do something to help release that. That would help him change his thinking and his approach. Very simply, he was able to stick to his service agreements. And he was able to work through that. But that's that's kind of a an out of the blue, uh, offhanded description of how emotions can interrupt what it is that we want to do, interrupt our goal orientation, and how by just noticing them, being aware when we get into a certain state of where it's coming from, that we can stop and regulate that in some way. And it's never that the feeling itself is wrong. I mean, one of the major concepts of emotional intelligence is that there are no bad emotions. There are no bad feelings. They all have useful information. And when we can accept that and work with them, then we're able to have our full sense of self involved in everything that we do. And we can also progress because we're noticing the things that sometimes limit us. Does that make sense? Yep. My question is, um, uh, we have been a creature of emotion for a long time, right? So why didn't we good at knowing our emotions or governing our emotions? I feel like we are really, really bad at that. At, at feeling our emotions? Yeah. You know, we, we learn a lot of things, but we didn't know how to, you know, uh, know how to learn our emotions, how to master that. And that's why I see a lot of people let their feelings run in the days, not, you know, letting 
their mind and you know they not controlling their feelings though right right and again some of this you know some of this is uh again it's social reality it's how different societies view emotions there are some cultures around the world that are a bit more accepting of emotion um and some of it, it also comes from early life experience some of it's from from how we were parented and parenting is also driven by that norm of social reality whatever it may be so given a particular society whatever the thought about how emotions are good or bad um will drive parenting so it, it's very deeply rooted in our human experience and yet at the same time more and more what we're finding through neuroscience and psychology is that when we're really able to open up and experience the the sensations that go with emotion and allow ourselves to experience and wonder and work with a particular feeling that we may be having um we just become more whole and in that we become more effective people actually become more productive when they're able to be more themselves and being more themselves is um deeply connected to whether they're connected to their feeling or not because if you if you spend think of it this way if you spend a good deal of your day rejecting the impulses that you're having that are connected to your thought you're dampening down a lot of information that comes from your experience which is who you are and you're not utilizing it you're just kind of stuffing it down uh, there are studies um, that show that when we just slam down an emotion, you know, just cut it off and uh, ignore it, or you know, just really try to control it very strongly, that uh, it uses more of our brain and it's more stressful. And if that's our only way of managing emotion, then over time, it uh, it really creates mental problems, it creates emotional problems. Whereas if we're able to open to the physical feelings, notice whether it comes, you can notice emotions in several ways. One is what you're thinking. Mm. Because if, if you're caught in a negative cycle of thinking, either it's self-criticism or you know you're just you're just being very negative in your thought then chances are that's being emotionally driven so if then you can stop and notice the feelings in your body and say where where is this for instance i have i've always had a lot of anxiety and again a lot of that was from stuffing my feelings for so long when i was a kid and i might notice that gee my shoulders are now up around my ears and you know my facial expression has tightened and uh, my breathing is shallow and all of a sudden i'd go god you know what's what's going on and just by relaxing that that's a start and then when we take the time to explore well where might that be coming from then uh we can identify that and often it's not necessarily directly connected to the current reality to being present and you know what's going on right now it's coming from somewhere else i used to feel that a lot when i was a young kid because uh for instance when i was in college i had several different kinds of jobs and once i was working for a psychological institution and they uh, had me doing admin work and i wasn't especially skilled at admin work and i would get that feeling just sitting at the typewriter with my shoulders up and the sense that i had was that my father was standing behind me criticizing me and so so i began to notice that 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 was a pattern and be able to tell when i was in a situation i was getting really tight and feeling incapable 
or whatever it was, but it wasn't necessarily connected to the current situation. Mm-hmm. And then I could relax out of that and begin to deal more effectively with what was going on right then. So it's, it's, it's developing that skill of noticing, first of all, what am I feeling? Because a lot of the time we are not paying attention to that. A lot of the time we've moved into persona where we're just trying to show positive and do all the, the physical aspects of being positive. And again, there may be something going on inside that's very different from that. I spent a lot of time teaching presentation skills, and it kind of reflected my acting when I was learning acting, where I would move into persona and represent feelings rather than actually open to them and allow myself to have them. And so when I was training, I would be very good at all the physical skills, open body language, voice, eye contact, all of the things that made me, you know, look very centered and professional, et cetera. And then I started doing a little more emotional work and people would often say to me, you know, Steve, when you first walked into the room, I was really intimidated by you, which would totally surprise me because I was intimidated by them. And I, here's an actor moving into a business environment and, uh, Eventually, as I did more of my own emotional work, I was able to stop and be authentic. Once I was in a workshop and uh, we were looking at 360 reports from the company, and one woman in the workshop got very upset. And usually I would have, again, pumped myself up and been very strong about that and probably made some superficial comments to her about everything would be okay. And in this situation, I had just been through a a weekend training and I was very open and I just dropped down and was able to experience a lot of empathy for her and really softened and stopped and talked with her about her, assured her that it was information that she could use and she was capable of of really working through that. And um, at the end of the workshop, I got this great response that shocked me because everybody was like, wow, when you went there, it just changed the whole workshop. And so I began to gain positive experiences like that that showed me that when I showed my vulnerability, and a lot of it has to do with vulnerability. Um, it put everyone else at ease. And we were all able to communicate much more fully because people weren't trying just to show a certain way. I see. Wow. Steve. My wife and I, we are working on the second book on thinking together. Because we just finished the first book on the topic of thinking. Right. And you mentioned about feelings and emotions a lot in the end, you know, and you've been reviewing, you know, like researching on it and, and try to understand it a lot more about it. I want to ask you your professional opinion about feeling. So how, you know, how did we create our feelings to start first, though? That's a very complicated <laughs> question to answer and uh you know i'll I'll point you again to lisa feldman barrett and her work i would highly suggest that you look her up on the internet she's a leading edge neuroscientist and she explains how the the mind works very well and the way she talks about it is that our brains are really prediction machines So based on experience, and, you know, again, it gets into our our early childhood experiences are all included in that. It learns to make predictions that have to do with our survival. And um, so from that, I, I really 
some people might argue with me, but I really think that um, it's very difficult, if at all possible, to separate thinking from feeling. Because it's all body brain related. And the brain is so connected to the body that they're constantly influencing each other. It's a chicken or the egg situation. Now, which happened first? Did I have a thought that made me feel a certain way? And the answer to that might be, that's possible. Or did I have a feeling that brought up a certain kind of thinking? And again, the answer to that is, that's possible. Because they work <laughs> very closely together. And... Um, you can, you, I mean, we have a lot of teaching, and again, this gets back to some degree to uh, toxic positivity, but we have a lot of teaching that, well, if you just think the right thoughts, you can be successful, you can be, uh, get your goal, and that's going to solve your life problems and any, you know, uncomfortable feelings that you may have. And, um, and, that's partially true. But there's also the flip side that our body sensations, I mean, she tells a, a very funny story about when she was in college, she went out on a date. She hadn't dated much at that point. And um, during the, the dinner situation, she just started feeling very strangely. And she hadn't been in love before. So she said, thought, well, this, this must be, I must be in love. And then <laughs> she went home, and in a couple of hours, she realized she was getting the flu. And, <laughs> and she tells that story to just illustrate that the body sensations are very tied to our feelings, and feelings are very tied to emotions. Now, we can make a little bit of a uh, a separation in definition and that the feelings are often, we might consider them more related to body sensation, whereas emotions are perhaps a continuation of those feelings, but emotions are another set of feelings that drive us toward a goal or have something to do with a goal. I don't know. Can I share a screen with you? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Let me try and bring up a model, and uh, where do I do that? Do you have to give me permission for that, or? I don't think that we need to give you the permission for doing that. I am not seeing the possibility for that. Um, well, I can, I could turn my screen, perhaps, just to... I'll try not to show you my messy office, but maybe if I turn it to look at my second monitor, I can just show you this model. Okay. Oops, I just turned it. Well, no, that's not going to work. I'm sorry. Anyway, there's a four square model that um, okay. I would like to show you. So I'll draw it on a piece of paper and hold it up. Um, Steve, you it, need to change it, the camera so you can be in cell again. I'm sorry? Uh, you need to change the camera, adjust the camera so you can be in the center again because you're now in, oh, on the left side. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it's a four square model. And up in this area, these are usually colored. And this comes out of. Uh, Yellow, and uh, I can see it. Yes, the, the study of mesquite, uh, the instrument, and also um, Mark Brackett's work from Yale, and 
It's called the mood meter. So up in this sector, this would be yellow, this would be green, this would be blue, and this would be red. Mm. And um, so this side of the scale is what we might consider positive emotions. And this side of the scale is what we might consider uncomfortable emotions or, or less comfortable emotions. And in the yellow area, we're looking at, at the intersection of two scales. And one is, we might say, is the intensity or the energy of the feeling. And the other is the pleasantness. So on this side, we have the less pleasant emotions. And on this side, we have more pleasant emotions. And up here would be very pleasant emotions. Down here is um, calmer emotions because the energy is not high. Up here is, you know, less pleasant emotions, high energy, which is often anger, discontent, those kinds of things. And down here would be more associated with sadness. And this is a very fast over simplification. So in most societies, we're very focused on these positive emotions. And when you look at this, the positive emotions are one of the things that, that's occurred to me is that they're largely associated on getting what you want. So when we get what we want, we're content, we're ecstatically happy, you know, whatever the range of emotion might be. When we're not getting what we want, we're angry, yeah. we're sad. Um, and it's not just getting what we want, it's things being the way we want them to be, that kind of thing. And that drives a lot of our feeling. And, uh, you know, most societies drive us to show on this side of getting what we want, you know, having a goal, being successful, getting what you want. And, but not getting what you want also drives anger and uh, sadness. Now, there, I, part of me wants to say there's nothing wrong with that relationship. And yet that's what creates a lot of strife in the world, in businesses, in our relationships, whatever it might be. So one of the goals of emotional intelligence is to be able to accept when you don't get what you want and work with that and stay open. Yep. Does that make sense? So that's, that's a big part of what we're dealing with when we're looking at emotional intelligence is um, not driving ourselves to always be over here and not okay. over controlling um, the left side. how we feel when we don't get what we want, but somehow bringing that together so that we can have a, a more complete experience of life and a more realistic experience of life. And um, I'm going to make a quick jump here, but then what also comes from that is more capacity for empathy and compassion. Studies were done that um, when we have a goal, our capacity for empathy goes way down because we're so focused on getting what we want that it brings up more competition, um, more reason to, got to get this off of your face, there you go, okay more reason to be angry, to be aggressive, whatever it might be. Um, the other thing that is important is that we can, we can work with ourselves on our level of understanding and um, the word acceptance is difficult for a lot of people because they think that's going to take away all my fight, that's going to you know, I'm going to be limited, but when we can work with ourselves on including what happens 
and accepting it, um, we become more capable. And one way to do that is through self-empathy. So this ties into when we're not accepting our emotions, that's sort of the primary action of not having empathy for yourself. And it actually creates another syndrome uh, that a, uh, a, a popular Buddhist monk talks about. Her name is Pema Chodron, and she talks about second suffering. And so when we have an uncomfortable emotion, we often put ourselves down and we create more suffering for ourselves because we're not able to just open up and experience that and glean its information because emotions are information and um, to some degree its purpose. So in the syndrome of not accepting our emotions, we're constantly creating more strife. The same thing happens in communication and relationship. When we're not able to understand a different culture or a different person, our spouses, whatever it might be, if we're not able to open to that, if we're not able to have self-empathy for ourselves in the situation, which will open us to empathy for them, then we have limited capacity to really work together and reach understanding. Yep. So yep. what happens when we, again, going back to working with emotions, when we're working with emotions, number one, we want to notice it. If there's thought associated with it, we want to notice that thought and the quality of the thought and consider it. It may not be true. We want to experience it in our bodies. We, you really want to experience a feeling, and that's what we cut off a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. But allow yourself to have that experience. This sounds like it takes a lot of time. But when you really start practicing this, it can be a matter of seconds. You just go, oh, whoa, what's that? Uh, you know? I, I want to ask you that question, Steve. Because uh, the starting point for all the change comes from noticing our emotions, right? Our feelings, right? Yes, yeah. And, and, and that is the key point because a lot of us don't know how to notice that. We let it drag in us, right? So yeah. if, if ever I got into a, a, a stage where my, the emotion running, then, then I need to have a weapon, a tool that helps me to notice, hey, ha. Huh, there's something wrong with me, my feeling, what's well, going on don't here? Say, don't say there's something wrong with me. I mean, you want to okay. say, that I want, I'm getting some information here I want to pay attention okay. to. It would be a way, better way to say that. But, you know, I part of it, it is just giving yourself, we don't pause in our days. So it can be as simple as creating a pause, maybe once an hour, maybe, you know, twice a morning, whatever it might be where you oh. just stop and check in and there may be nothing going on everything may be fine but if you, oh. if you begin to develop that i'm going to just check in right now and see okay how do how do i feel or how's how's my body am i carrying tension you know do i have a churning in my gut is mm. my chest tight things like that and it may not be but if you just develop the habit of, I'm going to pause, I'm going to give myself the assignment to pause. And you can make up how often, but it's developing, yeah. it's developing a habit of just pausing. And, you know, one way to think of it is, is pausing and expanding. I mean, one thing we do, because we're so focused on computers these days, most of the day, um, is that our focus becomes very narrow. And yeah. human beings have a lot of past evolution in us so that we benefit from having an expanded view, an expanded sense of what's around us. Because we used to be hunter-gatherers and we'd be out there looking at the horizon and 
trying to, you know, sense and notice where animals were and those kinds of things. And that's part of our actual physical structure. But we're now at a situation where we spend most of our days like this. So as part of your pause, if you just open up and look out the window and take in as much distance as you can, or if you look 12 feet away, or if you open up and imagine your energy opening up to the walls of the room that you're in. I see. Then that creates a that creates a break. It creates a different sense that allows you to again tune in as you're including the space around you. Does that make sense? Yeah. There are a lot yeah, of little techniques like that. Um, in fact, we do many um, self-management techniques all of the time. They've been built in. Some of them are better than others. But just taking a break, just switching what you're doing can be a way to change your emotional energy. Breathing is one of the most you know, powerful and most simple ways to just stop and breathe. That brings you into your body. Notice where your breath is going. Have a sense of filling your whole body with it instead of just your chest. All of those kinds of things. Um, there, there are many different kinds of ways to regulate our emotions. Is that helpful? Did I answer your question? Yep. You gave me yep. a lot yep. of uh, yep. tips yep. that can help yep. us to notice yep. indeed. Yep. But and this is really this is really important. There's another great book you might like since you like to read called Identity. And that it is by Francis Fukuyama. And I thought it was extremely extremely insightful. And he has talked about, and I think this is tied to how we deal with our emotions, because he talks about how we have evolved psychologically in a way that individuals are kind of starved for recognition. When you read a lot of uh, you know, business information these days and the direction management needs to go, so much of it is based on effectively recognizing people and re recognizing who they are and what their real talents are rather than putting them in a, in a you know, pigeonhole, square, square block and a round hole sort of thing. And uh, a lot of politics has emerged out of this. So that there are, he calls it identity politics. There are groups of people who have, you know, more like experiences that want to be recognized and, and uh, given their dignity for their particular group. And as I was reading this, I was thinking that this is so pertinent to emotional intelligence because the, the truth is most of us, most of the time, don't recognize ourselves because we're cutting ourselves off from the information and from the experience of our emotions. And experience, you know, experiencing emotions also has a lot to do with increasing our learning and increasing our capability because experiencing brings up that sense of passion that gives us drive and a connection to what we're doing. But because we're cutting that off, a lot of the time we've created some kind of persona and in that we're not recognizing ourselves. And I think this is where this evolved craving has come from, is that over time we've found reason to um, try to control emotions too much. And in that, we lose a sense of who we are, and we have this internal feeling that we're being denied. And actually, it begins with us denying ourselves. And um, I don't think that we've learned how to have self-empathy, how to really just make it okay that we're having a feeling. And then from that, 
that's the seed for empathy and compassion for other people. In psychology, it's called theater of, or not, uh, theory of mind. Theory of mind, where we're able to imagine how other people are experiencing something. So it's, um, I think this is an extremely important thing, although it's an extremely simple thing. I've learned fr from a lot of great people. I mean, there's, there's Mark Brackett from Yale, David Caruso from Yale, who created the, the Mesquite um, assessment. <clears throat> um, EQI 2.0 is another good assessment that looks at emotional intelligence from a trait-based point of view. But all of it, you know, and neuroscientists like Lisa Feldman Barrett, I mean, there are so many people that I have learned from because it's such a huge topic these days. There's a lot of information out there for people to take advantage of. <clears throat> but I just, uh, I just believe it, it is the thing that at this turning point can really help us. Because if everybody could reach that sense of a place where they have self-empathy, which opens themselves to other people and other perspectives, it would help us cut through some of the social reality beliefs that are really harsh, that create a lot of conflict, and that create a lot of unhappiness and lack of humanity in the world. Beautiful. Yep, I believe so too, Steve. All right. I have two last questions for our conversation today. All right. And you have a very good thinker. You accumulate a lot of information and you've been helping people through coaching, through training, through consulting uh, to help them to grow. Right. My wife and I, as you know, we've been on the quest to help people to improve their ability to think. Right. And and by simply asking experts like you this question. So, Steve, how have you been helping you to improve your ability to think over the years? <laughs> I hope there's some evidence of that. Uh, actually, I, I first thing that comes to mind is I think reading is very important. There are uh, many leaders of thought out there. Now, my brain is seems to be naturally constructed to create a lot of joy for me when I connect ideas. Everybody may not be wired that way, but I think reading is uh, one way to really open yourself up to different kinds of thought and certainly to read about thought. Um, one of the things that became a fascination for me, you were talking about uh, noise and I believe in noise, he mentions fundamental attribution error uh, as one of the cognitive errors. And again, I think this thing is something that um, really shows up in emotional intelligence. And that's that at, I can talk about the U.S. culture in particular. I think it's extremely prevalent here, and it may be a human thing based on survival, but I think we often judge people um, by making them responsible for how we're experiencing them. So, for instance, uh, I was in a, a job where I was the um, program manager of talent development, and I often had to deal with conflict between people in the organization. And there was one young man who was in the uh, help desk department who was particularly irascible. And people eventually totally dismissed him. I really had to work with him behaviorally to the best of my ability. But the flip side was, is that 
we decide that somebody's behavior is who they are. And that takes me back to the idea that our emotions are not who we are. And we often identify with our emotions and, you know, take them personally and, oh, I'm a bad person because I'm having uncomfortable feelings, blah, blah, blah. But we also do that on a much bigger uh, stage. And, and we will look at people and decide that it's a character flaw instead of a product of circumstances if they're expressing themselves in a way that we're not comfortable with. So things like that, becoming aware of uh, things like cognitive errors, which is something that has been studied. Now, again, some of this becomes an aspect of what is social reality. Um, and social reality is not always correct. But when you look at some of these big discoveries about thought and thinking and logic and explore those, that helps you change your thinking because it helps you separate from uh, what is perhaps negative social reality. And all of it was developed for seemingly positive reason. The other thing is meditation. I haven't talked about meditation, but I am a meditator. I do study mindfulness practices, and that is one of the things that has made me self-aware. And self-awareness is really the beginning and the foundation of emotional intelligence, and particularly as part of that emotional self-awareness. I can't believe it's taken me this long in our conversation to say that. <laughs> but... Uh, a big part of self-awareness is noticing your thinking and also, yeah, and, and, uh, and part of noticing your thinking is noticing that it's not always true yep. <laughs> it, and then questioning yep. it. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So reading and meditation is the way for you to expand your knowledge. At the same time, you can rethink about your, how you think and start questioning yeah, it also. Yeah. And, and perhaps mathematics. I was never good at mathematics, but I think mathematics teaches you to think. Yep. So again, uh, solving problems, doing exercises that help you solve problems or create require a different perspective. All of those kinds of things help you change your thinking. Absolutely. Yeah. Last but remember that you, thinking and emotion are very hard to to distinguish and experience. You cannot separate them, right? So it's a body living together. <laughs> Steve, the last question for you, and uh, this is I'm I'm trying to learn how people want to change the world in that way all right and then if it's boiled out to one li one single thing that you want people to improve on you know like uh, and make a positive change what would that single one item be, steve i I'd, i'd have to say to develop self-awareness and self-empathy because self <laughs> self-empathy is an extremely powerful thing when when we can be gentle with ourselves we can be gentle with other people and and through that connection we can come together we can understand and we can work together to create an inclusive world that is humane and i think our biggest error has been to uh, you know feel that there are enemies and that we have to deal with nature aggressively we have to deal with other people aggressively we have to win and i think a lot of that comes from fear and really from a lack of self-empathy There are big beliefs in the world. Another big concept is that uh, it's good and bad. It's just yeah. like when we look at that emotional chart, there's a good side, there's a bad side. Uh -uh. It's 
people reacting to circumstances. And I think if I agree with you on that point, thanks for sharing that. So if we if we're good at self awareness and self empathy, then you know we change ourselves first. That will create a change on the people around yeah. us. So yeah. uh, you know, and then that's how we're gonna help to create better you know like community, a better country, and you know eventually you know. That that's how goodness is gonna spread around the world, and that's how you know uh, how powerful if we learn how to improve our you know awareness and empathy. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So and it, think, the thinking is a big part of it. So I congratulate you for tackling that area, <laughs> because if we <laughs> we're also aware of our thinking, then we can change that. Yep. Oh. And we started that we started that journey just by understanding about ourselves, how we think first, you know, for me and my wife, so that we can better parenting our children. And then for them to understand, you know, how they can how how the process of thinking for them so that they can, you know, stay away from problem or learn from problems or, you know, or or, 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 or have a different way of expand the way of thinking first, then eventually, you know, for other people also. So Steve. It's wonderful opportunity for me to meet you on the, you know, on the very early of the year and and have you on the show. Thanks a lot for being so kind, so generous to spend your time uh, joining my program and share your stories, your thought, and a lot of amazing advices on emotions, about feelings, and and empathy. So I really appreciate that. Uh, I hope to meet you in person one day, all right? Okay. And let's have coffee together sometimes, okay? <laughs> okay? Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I've enjoyed it too, and thanks for what you're doing. Thank you very much. And uh, you have a wonderful day.